Hello everyone. Welcome back to the series of lectures in hematology. So, in continuation with acute leukemias, today we will be discussing about acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So, we have learned in the chapter of AML as well that in an adult, only 20% of the acute leukemias is usually an ALL, but in children and adolescents, more than 90% of the leukemias is usually an ALL. Okay, so when we speak of leukemia, it is usually the acute leukemias, right? So, ALL is more common in the children and adolescent age group as compared to the adults. The median age of diagnosis of ALL is usually at the age of 13 years. Okay, so the median age of diagnosis is usually in the age group of 13 years. So, based on the subtype, right, it can be classified as a B cell ALL as well as a T cell ALL. So, what do you mean by that? So, ALL, like any other leukemia, is characterized by a clonal proliferation of the lympho site lineage or the lymphocyte precursors in the bone marrow, right? So, we know that the lymphocytes are of two types. We have the B cell as well as the T cell. So, lymphoblastic leukemias which are basically neoplasms of the precursor lymphocyte. So, either can be a B cell lymphoblast or a T cell lymphoblast and that is how we have classified this. So, when it comes to B cell subtype, this is the subtype which is usually more common and it has a better prognosis. So, this is the one which is more common and has a better prognosis, whereas the T cell subtype is less common and it has a poorer prognosis. Okay, so what we have to know is ALL can be classified as B cell ALL and T cell ALL, and it can be further classified again on the basis of the CD markers which we will be looking at. So, what are the risk factors for the development of acute lymphoblastic leukemia in child? We say child mainly because it's more common in the children and adolescent age group. So, we have to remember Down syndrome. So, when we spoke about AML, we spoke that Down syndrome associated AML is in fact being classified separately. And in Down syndrome, the most common abnormality is TAM, which is transient abnormal myeloprolysis in the newborn. But remember that Down syndrome can be associated with AML as well as ALL. If there is an AML, it is usually the M7 subtype and it can be associated with an ALL as well, right? So, if anybody asks you what are the hematological manifestations with which Down syndrome can be associated, you have to remember this. Then, one is Down syndrome. Second, Risk factor can be this group of disorders which are usually associated with a defective DNA repair can also be associated with ALL. So, we have read this in AML chapter as well. So, this includes ataxia, telangiectasia as well as Bloom's syndrome. Okay. So, these are syndromes associated with defective DNA repair. Then definitely there is an increased risk of radiation exposure is associated with increased risk of AML. So, radiation exposure is associated with AML, it is associated with ALL and it is associated with CML as well. Okay. And fourthly, certain infections like EBV have also shown an association, but we definitely do not know whether it has been definitely proven. So, EBV is being associated with certain forms of acute lymphoplastic. Okay. okay. So, remember syndromes, Down syndrome, DNA repair defects, which includes Bloom syndrome and ataxia telangiectasia, radiation exposure and certain infections. So, what are the clinical features with which a patient with ALL is going to present, right? So, in an adult, usually they are going to present with pancytopenia picture. So, there will be some amount of low-grade fever, right? So, there can be some amount of low-grade fever, there can be Fatigue, there can be evidence of bleeding manifestations, fatigue because of anemia, bleeding manifestations because of thrombocytopenia. But we should be aware of important clinical features which is more common in children, right? So, in children, there is a definitive increased risk of CNS involvement and testicular involvement. So, if there is CNS involvement, they can present with headache, they can present with papal edema, they can present with seizures, right? All of this is mainly because of 
infiltration of the leukemic cells into the CNS and there can be meningeal involvement as well. Testicular involvement can present with testicular pain or a mass like lesion in the testis. Bony involvement is definitely a feature in children, so the patients can present with a limp while walking, they can present with pain while walking, especially in the long bones. Then involvement on in the mediastinum, so ALL can also present as mediastinal masses, right? It can present as mediastinal masses associated with mediastinal widening and hence this may cause compression and it may, on the trachea it may cause breathlessness or stridor as well. And bleeding manifestations is also very, very important because they can be an associated thrombocytopenia. Okay, so this is about the various clinical features. So you can have CNS involvement, testicular involvement, bone bleeding and mediastinal involvement. So remember, when compared to AML, the CNS involvement here is higher and a definitive testicular involvement. These are very, very important features which are characteristically different when you compare an ALL to an AML. Right? Fine. Now let us look at when you go on to the diagnosis, what are the different laboratory features that you will find. So in the laboratory features in the CBC definitely you will find increased, you will find increase in the WBC and you will find the evidence of lymphoblast. Right? So you find a sheet of cells which are lymphoblasts. So in the chapter on AML we have discussed how do you differentiate a myeloblast versus a lymphoblast. So a lymphoblast usually is smaller in size. So a lymphoblast is usually smaller in size. It's about 5 to 18 microns in size. It has a thicker nuclear membrane and it has a pale scanty cytoplasm. There are not many granules. Okay, so it has a pale scanty cytoplasm with not many granules. It has only around 1 to 2 nucleoli and the chromatin is also a little bit more condensed, right? So these are some of the salient features of how do you differentiate a lymphoblast versus myeloblast. So you can see the sheet of lymphoblasts which have completely replaced the marrow when or these findings can be found in the peripheral smear as well, okay? So these are about the different laboratory tests which show the evidence of an acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Then, do you need a lumbar puncture? Right, so this is a very characteristic uh, differentiating test which, which is slightly different from how you would evaluate a patient with acute myeloid leukemia. So yes, you do need a lumbar puncture because in almost 100% of the cases, especially in the childhood and adolescent age group, there is evidence of CNS involvement in a patient with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, right? So every patient before initiating treatment should undergo a lumbar puncture and a platelet count of more than 20,000 is said to be the cutoff for undergoing a lumbar puncture, especially in a patient with ALN. Okay? And in the lumbar puncture CSF analysis, if the, there are more than 5 ballasts per microliter in the CSF that is examined, then this is an indication of CSF or a CNS involvement and treatment is required. Okay, so remember this value more than 5 blasts per microliter in the CSF analysis. So let us understand the subtypes of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So we know, we have learnt it that there is a B cell subtype and T cell subtype, right? So B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemias can be classified as precursor B cell ALL, common B cell ALL, pre B cell ALL and mature B cell ALL. And we should be aware of certain CD markers which can be positive in this. So the common CD markers include CD 19, 22, 79A which are found basically universally in all the B cell precursors as well as mature B cells and hence these are common. Okay. Then TDT is positive up to the level of a pre B cell ALL. When the mature B cell happens, the TDT is removed off and hence in a mature B ALL you will not find TDT expression. Then CD10, CD10 is positive in your common ALL and pre-B ALL and how will you differentiate a pre-B ALL from a mature B ALL then? So pre-B ALL usually shows the presence of this cytoplasmic IgM. So cytoplasmic IgM positivity is seen in pre-B ALL and surface IgG is positive in mature B cell ALL. Right? So the presence of a cytoplasmic IgM is seen in pre-B ALL 
and a surface IgG is seen in mature B air. Okay, so this is about the different CD markers which are used for subclassification of the different types of acute lymphoblastic leukemias. Right, so when we speak about T cell ALL, the only two markers that you have to remember is that all of them will be CD3 and CD7 positive. Now, just like any other malignancy, we definitely have to prognosticate and what are the bad prognostic markers in a patient of ALL. So, always remember age extremes. If the age is less than 1 or more than 10 years, then this is considered to be a poor prognostic marker. As we all know, ALL is basically a disease of the children. And hence, if the age is less than 1 or more than 10, then it is considered to be a poor prognostic marker. Male sex is considered to be a poor prognostic marker. Involvement of the CNS or testis is itself is considered to be a poor prognostic marker. Evidence of organomegaly, mediastinal mass, hypodiploidy, T-cell ALL also has a poor prognosis. And certain chromosomal translocations 922, 1411 and 119, all of these are associated with poor prognosis. Okay, so try and remember the major points out of this. Now, whenever we try and treat a malignancy, there are certain terms which have now come up which we should be knowing in especially in the treatment of leukemias, right? So, when we try and treat a malignancy, our main aim is to put the patient into something called as a remission, right? And now, one step ahead of remission, we are able to do PCR-based studies and fluorescent in situ hybridization and in the samples to see if there is any evidence of minimal residual disease or MRD. So, nowadays the treatment is always focused towards achieving a certain percentage of MRD where the minimal residual disease has to be less than 0.01 percent, okay, has to be less than 0.01 percent especially in ALL, okay. So, this is certain definitions that you should be aware of. So, what is complete hematologic remission in a patient who is being treated for ALL. So, there are no leukemic cells which are detectable by light microscopy. That means that if you do a bone marrow, percentage of blast cells in the bone marrow has reduced to less than 5 percent. Then what is complete molecular remission or MRD negativity? So, you have a hematologic remission as well as a molecular remission because of the availability of fish and PCR more easily. So, in complete remission, MRD is less than 0.01 percent, right? That means there is less than one leukemia cell in 10,000 bone marrow cells identified. So, that is what we aim at, which is complete molecular remission, right? So, we have learned what is hematologic remission, what is molecular remission. Then, what is molecular failure? Molecular failure means that the MRD is more than, minimal residual disease is more than 0.01 percent. And relapse basically means that patient is still in remission according to the hematologic remission, right? So, the, if you do a bone marrow, the percentage of blast cells are still less than 5 percent. But if you do a molecular study, then he is not in remission and that is what we call as a molecular relapse. And hematologic relapse means that the percentage of blast is more than 5 percent in the bone marrow or in the blood, right? So, these are some of the important terms which you have to know and important decision making and goals you should be aware of especially in the treatment of AL, right? So, this is about some of the goals which you should be aware of especially in the treatment of AL. So, let us understand the treatment of acute lymphoblastic leukemia, right? So, there are sir, two important chemotherapy regimens. So, one that we had is the BFM-like regimen. The BFM-like regimen which was more commonly used in the child age group. Right? So, apart from that, another regimen which is commonly used is the hyper CVAD regimen. Okay? So, in this treatment of ALL, you always have a pre induction phase, an induction phase, and a consolidation phase. And you may have to alternate between induction consolidation for at least two to three cycles, and then only you go on and to the maintenance phase. So, always you have a pre induction, induction consolidation, pre induction consolidation, and then you go on to maintenance phase, right? So, remember two regimens are used. We have a BFM-like regimen. The BFM-like regimen was initially used in children. Currently, in adults, you can use a BFM-like regimen as well as a hyper CVAT regimen. So, what is the aim of the pre-induction phase? The pre-induction phase in ALL basically aims at reducing the tumor burden, okay? So, in the pre-induction phase in the BFM-like regimen, you use 
dexamethasone or prednisolone along with vincristin and donorosin. Then you move ahead to the induction phase where you can use cyclophosphamide or aracetidine or L-asparginase based regimen most commonly used is for induction is an L-asparginase. And consolidation is usually done by a high dose methotrexate along with a vincristin or an asparginase based therapy. So, in these phases, these are the drugs that are used. Always remember that methotrexate, especially high dose methotrexate is used because it has a higher CNS penetration. And if you are giving a CNS treatment, right? So, if there is evidence of CNS leukemia or even for prophylaxis, then intrathecal methotrexate or intrathecal triple therapy with methotrexate, aracy and dexorprednisolone along with cranial irradiation will also have to be done. So, especially in ALL, you have to take care of the CNS manifestations. And after this pre-induction consolidation phase, you will have to go into the maintenance regimen where you can use methotrexate or any other drug, right? And stem cell transplantation is usually considered in the complete remission phase 1. A hyper CVAR regimen is an alternative regimen that is done and here you use dexamethasone, vincristin, doxorubicin or cyclophosphamide along with alternating with a high dose methotrexate or a high dose aracy, right? So, you do an induction and consolidation alternatively. So, maintenance therapy is done every 2 years in all subtypes. So, maintenance therapy is done for at least 2 years in all the subtypes. And in between, you have to keep doing a MRD evaluation, right? So, after every consolidation phase, you may have to do an MRD evaluation to see if the patient is achieving consolidation or not. So, this flowchart may be slightly difficult. You do not have to remember all the names. Just remember the key regimens and the key drugs which are used in the management of AL, right? Also, we should be knowing that in this era, we are undertaking a lot of targeted therapies and immunotherapies, right? So, what are the different immunotherapy targets and the newer immunotherapies which are used in the management of ALL? So, we have anti-CD20 antibodies, rituximab, which is useful in Burkitt's lymphoma and B-cell precursor neoplasms, you can use anti-CD20 antibodies, ofatumumab. Then anti-CD22 antibodies can be used in mature B-ALL and B-cell precursor ALL, which includes eparatuzumab and inotuzumab. Anti-CD19, again we have a T cell activating therapies and bispecific CD3 and CD19 antibody which is bilantumumab and CAR T cell therapies, right? So, these are some of the immunotherapies which are now being considered in the management of AL. okay? So, with this we have come to the end of our discussion on acute lymphoplastic leukemia. So, we have learned what is ALL, how is it different from AML, it's a predominantly a disorder of childhood, right? And CNS involvement very, very important to take care of and how do you manage this? Thank you.